Awesome. So yes, I'll be talking about um, sensing systems again in the uh, in the context, maybe raising the the level of abstraction a little bit, and 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 talking about how humans play a role in this in this uh, interaction with sensing systems more broadly, in some of the recent work that we've been doing uh, in my group. Um, so you know we know that IoT continues to grow at a at a tremendous rate with IoT devices embedded in our environment, on our bodies. Uh, in our in our infrastructure, um, and you know, new uh, devices are hitting the market every day. And and there's there's a, a sort of interesting question from a sensing perspective of how do you integrate uh, all of this data together? There are communication challenges. Um, there's informational challenges. Um, taking a step back and thinking about IoT fundamentally in terms of the the problems that that we tackle as a group. Um, from our perspective, IoT is about sensing in the real world, okay? And, and this comes from, from a perspective that is driven by, um, uh, you know, a perspective that's been shaped over the 20 years, almost 20 years that I've been doing uh, IoT related work. It wasn't called IoT 20 years ago, but um, um, driven by the same things. Um, here's a um, sort of going, going back uh, one of the uh, motivating uh, slides for sensor networks because before it was IOT it was sensing um, <clears throat> that sensors were the sort of natural next step in the evolution of computation and that of course none of these other tiers go away so number crunching and data storage remain we're still seeing a lot of architectures pushing their data to the, to the cloud that, that these sort of middle tier computational devices are still for interactivity and that sensing is really about streaming information to and from the physical world. And the view of sensor networks, uh, again, uh, uh, back in around 2004 was, you know, we wanna support all sorts of uh, uh, monitoring uh, applications and managing of spaces and things. And there's a challenge in building that architecture to go from these relatively uh, low power, uh, small devices, all the way up to enable uh, uh, the kinds of applications that, that were envisioned at the time. And in fact, you could argue that sensor networks, if we're still talking about it today, and in, and in many cases from these application examples was very successful. You know, um, there were deployments done on infrastructure a famous one on the Golden Gate Bridge to monitor the um, the the vibration <laughs> in the bridge uh, on various walls uh, and all the rest of it. There was uh, there were slot there were um, sensors that were deployed in in uh, ecological environments to measure H two O and microclimates, and this was also very successful. Again embedding these sensors in the real world, dealing with things like running out of batteries, dealing with um, con connectivity issues. Um, and yet, you know, those were uh, eventually overcome. And an area that's very uh, near and dear to me is, is in smart buildings. And if you see, this is a slide from 2004, and yet we're asking the same questions. How do we, you know, buildings are still consuming 40% of the energy produced in the United States and nearly three quarters of the electricity, they still represent these large sensor networks, wired sensor networks rather than wireless. And it was a question of how do we take all that information and, and do something useful with it? So those, those questions still remain. Now, um, lots of progress made in the research community for taking these sensors um, and, and really honing in on the stack. And it was really that there was this observation that although there is, there, there, all, there exists infrastructure that already has embedded sensing in it, but most of the bits are dropped on the floor. And so most things are lost as they're transmitted from the network up to the uh, up your, um, uh, your mainframe or, or your, your, in this case, in today, you know, the cloud. Um, and so, you know, over a decade of research of moving the bits from here to there were reliable, right? That was, that was the sort of thrust of the work. 
And so <clears throat> moving forward from sensor networks of what we call IoT today, um, we want to move essentially from bits uh, to concepts. Uh, AI and ML, as we've seen throughout many of the, of the works presented today, has emerged as a leading tool accelerating application progress. Uh, but we're still, remember the real world aspect of this is what makes this particularly challenging and why I think many applications perhaps haven't advanced quite as much as we had hoped. It's that we are still limited by physics and, um, and human behavior and interaction in these spaces is still a limiting factor. We expect that the systems will highly will be highly automated and yet, you know, without understanding that humans make mistakes or get frustrated and turn things off, uh, all that automation goes to, uh, down the drain. Okay, so broadly speaking, we're sort of incorporating the human into this aspect and we're thinking more broadly about the computational and information challenges that involve humans and real world physical constraints. So moving forward, of course, rather than moving bits reliably, uh, where the, our group is, is focused on extracting concepts robustly from, uh, from uh, these sensors in the environment and, and, and taking into account uh, human behavior, trying to predict it and understand what role it plays uh, in the broader sensing system. And the fact that we're limited by physics. So we have to consider systematic design of our deployments in such a way that we can overcome or at least improve the robustness of the inferences we're drawing from the data. And so this is a, a kind of a emerging area that folks have talked about for a couple of years now, cyber physical human systems. So the fundamental question that we've been looking at is what's the interplay between sensing physical constraints and natural variance that occurs in real world phenomena. So when you deploy a sensor in a physical environment, um, how does that, how does the actual physical environment play a role? How does movement play a role? How does interaction play a role? So I'm gonna <clears throat> spend the bulk of my time essentially talking about two uh, applications as, as sort of real world case studies. One is uh, how we can use multi-sensing to bridge the semantic gap uh, between measurement and context to enable new classes of applications. And we have a project, an active project now called Project Maestro which I'll talk, uh, talk about in the next few slides. And the second one is more about specifically interaction and trying to infer uh, different actions and human behavior through a multi-sensing environment, and specifically <laughs> in a vehicular environment that's been, uh, that's been um, uh, uh, enhanced with extra sensing. Okay, and that's Project Pause that I'll, I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit about. So in the first project, Project Maestro, we developed a platform uh, that takes commodity off the shelf sensors and puts them on a single board and then deploys this in your smart space. You plug it in and just measure um, uh, everything you can, everything that we can fit on the board and try to learn what's happening in the environment. This general, um, formulation, this general uh, problem is called general purpose sensing. Uh, there was a paper a few years back that talked about the, uh, that showed some of the, um, some of the properties of general purpose sensing that by sensing, you know, 18 different channels over 10 different sensors on, on a single device, there's quite a bit of information that you could extract about various human activities happening in space. So, uh, depending on where you put it, if you put it in a car, you can you can tell when the windows were opened or closed, when the car was merging into a lane, um, when they were approaching a highway, when they were starting the car. So lots of contextual, semantically meaningful contextual information can be extracted just from uh, the physical sensing space without having a camera uh, uh, in, in place here. Um, putting this in a kitchen or, or in a smart, uh, in a sort of open space that happens to have a kitchen in it. We can tell when the microwave is on, how long it's on for, um, whether there's a TV that happens to be uh, streaming data, whether there's a floor lamp or kitchen lights on. So lots of contextual information, lots of bits that, that can be extracted. Um, the interesting idea around general purpose sensing is imagining that you can layer these sensing tiers. So you extract semantically meaningful labels and then you put these together to create 
um, to, to, to build, for instance, state uh, transition models of different objects. So the, here's an example of, uh, I know when you open or, or close the door to your microwave, I know when it's on, I know when it's in use, I know when you finished, you know, all of these bits together, uh, you, you add yet another, uh, you know, go one layer above, uh, take these concepts, put them together and extract a, um, um, the state of the, of the system. There are some other examples where uh, a multi-sensing unit is, is embedded in, a, in a, it's put in the bathroom next to a uh, towel dispenser and you can keep counting how many towels uh, were extracted and those sensors, virtual sensors that uh, contact the building manager when, when you're out of towels. Oops, maybe that would happen. One second, gotta get back to my slide. Okay, um, <clears throat> the interaction uh, for enabling this application was simply to place a sensor where you, where you want to perform the activity recognition, uh, hit record when the recording is done, you label it, uh, you, it trains, it was in this case, it was using some shallow model training to train and voila, you're done, you get your um, uh, activity stream. Of course, this is a uh, simplistic view of, of the general purpose sensing problem. And, and, and this is a sort of first step towards this notion of general purpose sensing. Um, the main activity here, of course, is that, you know, sorry, the main problem here, of course, is that you know, it's not realistic. Uh, uh, human activities are very complicated. Uh, there are all sorts of challenges with where the phenomena is occurring relative to what you're sensing and where you're sensing it and how that changes over time. You know, distribution shift is a, is a well-known problem in human activity recognition and in many real world applications. And so we were, we were asking the question, how can we take this a step further and map all the lessons we learned about sensing into this general purpose sensing problem? So can we robustly learn human activities in space through ambient distributed multi-sensing? Of course, ambient being it's contactless and it's in the environment distributed because we need reinforcement of, of the signal. Um, so we uh, created our own platform, our own multi-sensing platform, Maestro, which uh, contains 10 different sensors, 18 different sensing channels, everything being measured uh, 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 synchronously so that we could uh, map these two activities. Um, the main idea here is Many of these sensors are, many of the prior work in this space looks at, you could imagine that this multi-sensing uh, environment or, the, or the, the, the data that you get back is a matrix with rows representing the sensors, the um, rows representing each sensor, the columns representing time. Um, signals are typically extracted from a single row. And here we're looking at correlated patterns across, uh, we're not just looking at patterns within each row, but also across the columns and, uh, and um, spatially across, uh, across the matrix. Um, we deployed Maestro in a test bed uh, in some in initial experiments that we ran in the WinLab. There were 10 activities that were performed in this space. And you can see that you know, we ended up placing um, uh, three different boxes. They happen to be called sent box four, five, and six. Um, uh, but essentially what we observed is that um, the activity vector, if you will, based on the baseline activations of those sensors actually changes across the box. So for instance, these two boxes, which happen to be, you know, they're, they're all roughly equidistant from each other, um, yet box four and five look a lot more similar than what was observed uh, in box six, perhaps because there was a structure blocking box six. And so, the physical layout of the space actually played a role in what, what these boxes were observing. Um, box four and five didn't always agree in this food processing and vacuum activity, for instance, the, 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 the activations across the sensing units were, were quite different. Um, but for the most part, these two matrices, the four and five look more similar than, than they do to six, okay? And so um, that's one general observation, yes, uh, Putting a single sensor somewhere is not going to cut it for general purpose sensing. I think that was kind of an obvious um, uh, 
observation, but here is the experimental data to sort of support that. Um, uh, some interesting things that you get from multi-sensing, uh, this surprising observation that in fact, the most interesting or the most sort of triggered signal when operating the drill was the light intensity and not the vibration. So, um, you know, again, interesting features emerged in this, in this multi-sensing um, uh, uh, setup of, of, of human activity recognition uh, in these spaces. Okay, so we also wanted to examine uh, the effects on, you know, examine essentially robustness. And again, we're doing this empirically. We design a multi-sensing uh, feature extraction uh, network that essentially takes these matrices and um, and learns a class variability distribution over over the different activities, and we see that uh, in fact multiple sensors does improve classification performance. Everything, all of the graphs are moving uh, up into the right. That's a that's a good thing. Um, it, it's certainly good and cheap to to do uh, multi sensing uh, in these spaces. The effect of different uh, sensors is more pronounced for different locations. And so we're starting to, to see that there are different properties with respect to placement, with respect to where, uh, what phenomena you're measuring uh, and where you're doing the deployment. And that's some of the things that we're starting to tease apart um, in, in ongoing work. So um, some of the other uh, questions we're asking in this active work is, is one sensor enough or is general purpose sensing a pipe dream? It's clear that one sensor is not enough uh, from, from, from this data that it strongly suggests that, that in fact, that's not going to be possible, but you know, that's what sensing was all about uh, in the first place. Um, distributed sensing was about in the first place. Is there a contextual embedding that allows us to discover unlabeled or new uh, events? So we, can we characterize the, um, the space uh, the, the, the space that the sensors are embedded in through the measurements that are being made and how does that help us perhaps identify new events, right? So we, we observe a new activity, it's triggering a different uh, uh, correlated pattern across our multi-sensing unit. Um, is there a way of, of identifying that in fact there's structure and it's something new so that we can obtain a label? So there's, there's also this uh, this notion of active learning being uh, an integral part of characterizing an environment um, to bridge that semantic gap. And then of course, the, the, the question about, about, uh, about robustness, um, can we robustly classify human activities and spaces that hit, have these different physical characteristics? Um, you have differences in, you know, all over the place, not just with the sensors themselves, but with the layout, the layout of the space, the placement of the sensors, a lot of the same um, uh, problems that we saw 20 years ago, but now through the, uh, through the lens of, of machine learning and, and uh, data collection framework. So these are, these are some of the problems that we've, we've started uh, examining. Um, we have a big deployment we just did um, in uh, Weeks Hall and another one in the Wind Lab so that we can get indoor uh, location and we're driving around the robot and, and um, uh, uh, recruiting various people to, to obtain uh, data from uh, actively. So this data set uh, continues to grow. Um, some of the applications that we see, there's an interesting robotics application that has, that's called action mapping. And that's looking at a physical space and um, uh, casting a probability distribution over different labels of different actions that take place in that space. And so the idea there is that they are mapping the visual features of a, of a space with the distribution of actions that take place on the, on those, in that space and on the objects in that space. So we want to enhance that with, uh, with these uh, multi-sensing units um, and, 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 and enable new types of applications, not just the tiered one that you saw in the, in the initial slides, but also questions about the history of the space and actions that have occurred in that space, even without a camera, asking questions like, where did I leave my keys? How long did I watch TV last night for? Or what's my average TV watching time? Um, how much time does it take on average to cook my dinner? Right? Asking these sort of high level, uh, semantically um, 
rich questions and decomposing those down to the measurements being uh, taken in the space over time. <clears throat> so in the second question, in the second project um, that I wanna discuss is, is about um, the, uh, a smart vehicle environment and using multi-sensing to predict um, human state. Um, in this case, it was when is a good time to interact with the driver, uh, and and this is a, a pretty in, this is a pretty complex question because it's essentially involves figuring out you know the state of the road, the state of the driver with respect to with respect to the context outside on the road or whether they're looking at their phone or doing other activities, and we wanted to see if we could combine all of this, all of these sensor streams together to, um, uh, to infer when is a good time to interact with them. So uh, an initial, a data set was uh, collected through some colleagues uh, over at Stanford. They did a deployment and, um, and they enhanced a, they retro, they fitted a car with a number of sensors. They had some external cameras um, they had a CAN sensor inside the car. Um, um, they had an internal body camera that actually had the body from several angles, some physiological sensors. Um, and we wanted to essentially combine these human factors with these synth system or contextual factors to, to infer or, or, or to guess when is a good time to interrupt them. So here's just another view of some of the streams that we had and the data that was available to us. So we had um, automotive data, physiological data, various streams uh, from those, uh, and visual features. Uh, 64 different drivers, 50 minutes, uh, over 2,700 moments where they were asked whether now was a good time. Um, let me see if I, one second here. Um, I don't know if I, I don't know if you can hear that. You probably can't. Let me try this. Optimize video clip and share sound. Okay. So this is what uh, a, we know one um, uh, event looks like. Is now a good time? Yes. Okay. So essentially, they would randomly be asked if now was a good time, and we would try to characterize the context around the answer. Um, some interesting observations that are not explicitly baked into the model are things like, you know, body position and distraction, right? Uh, if they're merging, they might look uh, at their mirrors and, and adjust their body position. So we thought this would be an important factor uh, to extract from the data or that the data in fact would extract automatically. Um, that when they're looking forward, they're not distracted and it's prob probably is a good time. Now, of course, the state of the road also plays a role in that, in that decision. Um, some things that we thought would be useful to extract explicitly are, in fact, the body position, the face, the hands. And of course, we use open pose for that. Um, the time series input data, we can see that both of these are time series in nature. There's many of them, and we want to combine them in some uh, sensor fusion uh, architecture shown here, um, it's this, this multi-channel uh, network that fuses all the various data sources together. Some of these channels are pre-trained. So these I3D inception features, for instance, are pre-trained. We used some pre-trained weights and we did uh, transfer learning to adapt those weights to the data we had. Um, channels two and three are the time series data. Um, uh, combined directly and processed through a multi-layer CNN. And the last channel consisted of face, hand, and body for the internal cameras. So in all, we're sort of trying to capture external state, state of the car, physiological state of the human, and um, the visual appearance of the human. So here's an example of where our network predicted that it was a good time. Is now a good time? Yes. Okay, so similar, you know, uh, consistent with the characteristics we would have expected that they're looking forward 
um, that there's not a lot of traffic on the road. Uh, these kinds of contextual um, uh, signals are, 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 you know, being pulled out of the out of the out of the model. Here's another. There's a no example. Is now a good time? No. Getting on the freeway. Okay. Um, you know, in general, our model performed quite well. We uh, ran some extensive experiments. Um, we had a very high F1 score. One interesting thing is that we we um, adjusted the um, the loss function so that we would minimize the uh, false positives, so we don't um, interrupt when they are busy. Uh, and and in fact, that still led to uh, lots of opportunities for in a fifty minute drive anyway to to interrupt. So even with a conservative model, um, we didn't suppress all opportunities. Uh, to, uh, to interrupt. Um, we had a second question, uh, is this safe or not? Um, and we had third party annotators uh, look, at, um, look at the videos and, and decide whether or not it was safe. And then we retrained POSNET with these labels. Um, and you know, we can then um, put these together in an actual system that will interrupt with some information or, 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 you know, or anything else. Um, that will first evaluate whether it's safe, at least from a third-party perspective, and whether it whether it's a good time to interrupt based on you know external context, physiological measurements, uh, body position, et cetera. And and we do a full ablation study in in the in the work as well. So um, if you're interested in the details, please uh, uh, examine examine this uh, publication. Uh, here's just an example of the safety question. Is now the time? So Cosmo thinks it's not safe. The driver doesn't reply. We took that as a no as well because they were distracted. Oops. Here's yet another one. Um, so, whoops. Sometimes people are not good at perhaps uh, assessing the safety of the situation. And here's an example of one. Is now the time? Oh, yes. I'm just making a turn. Okay. So in this case, the folks who, who observed this and provided labels for our model uh, thought this wasn't a good time. And so we went with that. Uh, PASNET also uh, predicted that it wouldn't be a good time, but in this case, the driver and PASNET disagree about when is a good time. Okay, so um, we saw that this multimodal sensing environment in the car at least allows us to more naturally interact and to sort of observe the whole scene and make decisions, explicit decisions about some kind of intervention, whether that can, whether that intervention will be automatic or whether it'll be with a human in the loop is, is a question to be explored. Um, so it can improve interaction with drivers. We can learn more about the context. Um, we did a full ablation study, as I mentioned, and that's in the paper. And that these immersive environments with these, you know, combining all of these uh, sensing modalities can be used to approximate very complex Human behavior, um, and you know, we're we're interested in things like how humans are interacting with each other, you know, what the human intent is, and how that affects a C potentially a CPS decision that needs to be made, a, a decision being made by a cyber physical system. So, in conclusion, um, <clears throat> I argue that you know, IoT is about sensing and extracting concepts about the physical world and people in it. That multi-sensing is a useful thing. You get lots of information and you get it for free, at least from an information perspective. Um, and that it can be used to infer complex uh, implicit and explicit signaling for, uh, for feedback into the CPS about human behavior. And that cyber, cyber physical human systems are this important new frontier for the advancements of both IoT and CPS. And I'll leave you with, uh, uh, a list of uh, some publications that have more information and open up to any questions you might have.